This is Trevor Heron from Blue Heron Entertainment, and you're listening to Legends of Tabletop. Hey, everybody. This is John. I am Sans Vince again. Uh, he's had uh, some personal things come up. Uh, you're listening to episode 53 of the Legends of Tabletop mm-hmm. podcast. We have Trevor with us tonight, as you heard, from Blue Heron Games. We're going to be talking about collectors and capers. Uh, so, uh, Trevor, how's it going? It's going very well, John. It's great to be on the show. Oh, thank you for coming on. We love to uh, to help uh, promote all these various Kickstarters and whatnot as uh, people contact us. It's a uh, you know little way to give back a little bit, I guess, and try to help uh, people get their their uh, projects funded and you know successful. So that's awesome for us, and you know we we enjoy talking to all these different developers and designers. It's pretty cool. And it's great to be it's great to be here. Awesome. We, uh, we have a thing we like to start the show off with. It's something cool. I think All we right. need to change the name because I'm kind of hit and miss on that. But, uh, you know, something cool that's happened to you in the last week or so, or, you know, it could be last month or whatever cool movie, uh, uh, you know, a nice good game that you played, uh, anything like that. Right. Well, as for games, I've basically been playing Collectors and Capers for the past nine months <laughs> on end. But cool thing that's happened to me i recently got a 3d printer nice. just the first one the small micro 3d and i've been playing around with that for the past few days just absolutely going to town trying to figure out like okay so if i want to make a die that looks like this how does that work and what does it look <laughs> like and oh i need to get sandpaper absolutely the wonders of technology now it's great that's pretty cool. You got to download. There's a whole library of uh, like Dungeons and Dragons minis. That's where you got to go. Uh, oh <laughs> yes, I'm going. I'm going to be looking on there. I mean, if I get into a D and D campaign soon, don't you worry. My character will have a nice mini. <laughs> That's awesome. I I don't have anything particularly going on for the last week or so uh been playing a lot of uh, a lot of board games and and whatnot so that's a that's a new thing for me i'm more of an rpg gamer than a board gamer but uh you know with doing the reviews and things i've been you know trying to kind of get into that a little bit more to sort of understand game design and you know different types of games and things so that that's been pretty fun for me here recently nice nice yeah. So, uh, so we have you on, we're going to talk about collectors and capers. It's uh, mm-hmm. it's your first Kickstarter. It's your, your first game that you have released. Exactly. It's my, my first baby, my first Kickstarter. It's been a wild ride going all the way from just scribbles in a notebook all the way to here. Honestly, I'm still pinching myself tr- saying, am I, am I dreaming? Do I have a, do I have collectors and capers actually on Kickstarter? Yes, I do. And it is not doing too shabbily. I'm quite pleased with how it's doing so far. Yeah, you guys are hammering it right out of the gate. You're already uh, about uh, 70% funded. Got uh, over 100 uh, backers on Kickstarter so far. Mm-hmm. You're just about to the goal. And you still got a ton of days left. So you're, you're in pretty good shape. I know. And I and personally, I want to get past the, the initial goal and get started into the more fun stretch goals. You know, adding another treasure. I mean, you play you played it. It has six treasures. Mm-hmm. But what but what about a seventh one? One that you, the backers, I'm speaking to you viewers, would want to choose. What do you want to go with like the red herring, something along the lines of a heist film or murder mystery thing? Or maybe even something that's based off of pop culture. It'd be up for you to decide. I, I have to say, I do love the Cthulhu statue as the uh, ancient statue. <laughs> oh, I, that was one of the ones that I, I knew what it was wanted. I think the one that I had to say to the artist, okay, that's a great picture of, uh, of David that you did, but I was thinking <laughs> more tentacles. Yeah. And had to explain the concept of Cthulhu. And that, that was interesting. Hmm. Okay. Is the artist a non-gamer or a, a non-Lovecraftian? She, she's a non-Lovecraftian. She is a gamer, and I have to give a shout-out to her because she did fantastic work. Nike Onodon, she's a freelance artist. And you love the work of Collectors and Capers, Art Deco theme. All of that is her picking my brain and putting it onto the paper. Yeah, it's cool. It's a, it's a really nice... 
nice style, all that black and gold and, and, you know, the, the, the logo and everything that really, it really kind of catches your eye. It really harkens back to that, that, that whole feel, um, which, which yeah. is nice for the game. Cause it, it, you know, it plays to the theme very well. Well, and that was one of the goals I, I set out where I went, okay, so I want to do a game about lying and bluffing. What is the first thing that comes to mind? A heist, stealing, thievery. And what do I think of? A museum. Okay, so what do I think of when I think of a museum? Well, I think of the grand museums in New York that are opulent and 1920s themed. All right, let's roll with that and see what see how that goes from there. And Honestly, it turned out a lot better than I thought it, I, it could, <laughs> and definitely in what I could do. Right. Well, how long was the game in development before before you finally said, all right, look, I, I just got to put it out. No more fooling around. Let's just, let's do it. Well, about a year and a half ago, I started work on it and started working on the uh, base mechanics and all of that and, and sort of the initial idea. Then I, then I hit a roadblock for about a month or two and then Revelation figured out what the, the absolute ba- best mechanics were for the theme as mechanics as metaphor and rolled along with that for uh, for up until now i mean sort of got it never looked back cool very cool uh, let me see here I'm, I'm going back and forth so you're uh, so the game was a semi-finalist for the 2016 lucy award did mm-hmm. you guys lose out to uh dice of crowns is that the uh, the same uh polling? We, did, we did lose out the dice of crowns excellent game but it definitely did some interesting things. And Collectors and Capers caters more to the longer form game night, bringing out people who aren't necessarily gamers. Like people, people who would say, you know, I'd like to play some gin rummy. And you say, ah, well, how about <laughs> this instead? Right. Different crowds and absolutely love Dice of Crowns. But I still prefer Collectors and Capers. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Can't knock you for that. <laughs> That's cool. So uh, you guys are, are part of uh, the, uh, let me see, I'm working back and forth between two screens here. Play mm-hmm. Test Northwest. Yes. Um, you guys are, are in with them. Uh, did you play test um, collectors and capers with, with that group for a while? Yes, we did. And also I had play testers on the East Coast, some good college buddies of mine who weren't afraid of saying, so we love you, but this needs this, we can't make heads or tails of the rules. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, so I'll rework them and all that. So it was a combination of Playtest Northwest, which taught me a lot throughout the process, especially that with the with games as a art form, the players are imperative to the art itself. I mean, you can have a movie and play, people don't interact with the movie, but with a game, it's not complete until someone is playing it. So listening to people, hearing what they have to say, and really digging down into what is their criticism and why are they making it. Mm-hmm. And Playtest Northwest helped bring those opportunities and the community there helped show me how to listen to those comments in the best possible way. And, and that's the nice thing about a group like that is because they are, you know, inclusive and helpful. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's not like, well, we can't help you because, you know, we have our game. They're like, no, you have your game. Let's bring it. And we'll, you right. know, we'll show right. you how to fix it or, you know, tell you how good it is. If it's, you know, that great right out of the box. Exactly. Or it's good, but. Right. And then. <laughs> Then constructive criticism goes here, sort of thing. Right. And and constructive criticism, that's the key. I mean, exactly. you know, some people will play a game and, you know, it might not be a game that they, you know, enjoy as, you know, pastime. Maybe they're more of a, you know, a card gamer or a dice gamer or, right. you know, like a long play board gamer. And they're like, well, I don't like it. And that's not really all that helpful. <laughs> and you get those comments and it goes, okay, you know, I see where you're coming from. But the intent of the design wasn't necessarily to please everyone because you're not going to please anyone. If the internet has taught anyone anything, it's that you can't please everyone. Mm-hmm. For sure. And with 
with collectors and capers, I had distinct demographic and group in mind, and that was people who want to play games but aren't necessarily going for a full competitive experience. Like, if you want to do that, you could do Magic the Gathering or Hearthstone or any number of other games. But this is, you have a game night, you have people, you want to spice it up a bit. Sort of like a $5 buy-in for poker. Yeah. (laughs) So it really is designed for that group and to be quick. And some people like longer games. I love longer games as well, but this was not designed to do that necessarily. Right. Uh, I love a short game. Uh, beer and pretzels, filler, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it. That's uh, so in my wheelhouse. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you can play either a lot of games of the same game or you mix right. it up and you play three or four different kinds of games. Or, you know, if you're <clears throat> if you're in a and d session or something like that and somebody calls and says, hey, I'm going to be a half hour late. Mm-hmm. Boom, you pull out collectors and capers. You can finish a whole game before they even get there, and then you're double dipping for the night. It's great. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's absolutely the way to do it. Um, so uh, what's your background in game design? Like what, what, what's your regular gig for work? Or, you know, are you um, a game designer by, by profession? Or you're like, hey, I like games, and I want to make one, because why not? Well... By trade, I am a software developer and a SDET for a consulting com- company. Do it. And that's that's what I do. That's what I went to college for. Taught me lots of great things, technical, how to look at things analytically. And for me, I then did a game design certificate recently to talk to learn more about the actual craft of game design. Because I'd always been playing games my whole life, ranging from the uh, card version of Settlers of Catan with my mother to Mm. Ticket to Ride, Rat Attack Cat, all those sorts of family games. And so I went, you know, I have ideas. I want to make games. I like doing, I like doing this. I like creating things. So in answer to your question, my day job is software and my night job, what I do after hours on my own time is make games and i have collectors and capers it's my first game by no means is it going to be my last game and yeah that that's that's the whole thing yeah cool uh were were you nervous coming to kickstarter as someone who didn't have you know a game to show previously and be like well people maybe they'll be hesitant because i'm not Mm -hmm. you know proven sort of thing so was, was there any of that going on for you Oh, definitely. I mean, as soon as you're tipping your toe into new waters, it's always nerve-wracking. Kickstarter, sort of going, I don't have the biggest social media following myself, and I'm trying to gather all of that. I'm new to the whole game. It's my first Kickstarter. I'm 25 and supposedly irresponsible. So, (laughs) you know, there are many reasons why people would give a wary eye to this, but... I work night and day to make sure that this is going to happen because I want nothing more than to walk into a game store that I've only heard about from an order, find my game on the shelves, and hear people exclaiming about how good it is or how they're having fun while playing it. That is the goal that I want to have. So, I mean, is it nervous? Is it nerve-wracking? Yes. It's also, <laughs> it's also bloody exciting. Mm-hmm. Were you prepared uh, mentally for Kickstarter and, and, you know, all these trials and tribulations and you get that typical kind of down period in the middle and, you know, you shoot right out of the gate and, you know, mm-hmm. like you were saying, all the social media stuff. So were you, did, we, did you have eyes open when you, when you went in and started? Well, I think I have to say this is a classic example of someone saying, you know, you need to watch out for it. And, some, and you saying, yeah, yeah, I, I, I see it. I know what's happening. I, I, I understand what's happening and then being different when you are experiencing it. In the game design certificate and with the University of Washington, we looked and examined several Kickstarters to see and to bet on whether or not they would succeed or not. And sort of, we looked through historical data and sort of went, okay, so everything goes in an initial jump and then a roll and then a tick up towards the end. And 
sort of expected that, knew that people had a lot of work going into it. But I'm not sure anything really prepares you for that, <laughs> except if you either personally help someone with their Kickstarter and you witness that firsthand, or if you just jump into the deep end like I foolishly did and, <laughs> and experience it. I mean, absolutely nerve-wracking at times, sort of going, okay, if every backer counts. Thank you for your support. It's great. Spread the spread the news, spread the word. I really wish I was on the front page, but there's so many other good <laughs> Kickstarters occupying it right now, but I'll get my chance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're doing great. So, I mean, you know, kudos to you to, to have to, to be where you're at with, you know, you know, this okay. short a period of time into the game. So I, uh, I think you're okay. <laughs> well, I like to think so too, but you can never be too careful. And I have to th- give a shout out to my backers. If you are watching this, thank you. You make this possible. I can't do it without you. As someone who is handling all of this by myself, you help make the magic come alive. And that's the cool thing about Kickstarter, right? Is like you can do that and people can, you know, email you or, you know, you have the updates coming every couple of days or every day Mm -hmm. or whatever. And it's a very involved process for both creator and, uh, purchaser or whatever you want to call it and person on the other end of the line. Right. Um, and that, that's a very cool thing as someone who, who backs Kickstarters and stuff is that you, you know, there is that sort of, you know, back and forth and, and, you know, like you're saying like, Hey, you know, we'll put up a poll. You guys can pick the next card. Like that, that's pretty neat. Like Park right. brothers, isn't going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, that, and, and that's really the thing. It's a, I've seen my, uh, I got introduced to Kickstarter when I was in college and it sort of astounded me that, that this was a thing. And I was like, wow, you mean I get to hear from the people that create the game or that are doing this movie project and they can tell me and message me and let me know what's going on during the whole process. That's amazing. This is a, (laughs) this is a whole new distribution method that, what would it be 10 years ago wouldn't be available at all. Mm -mm. I mean, I am fortunate to be able to put collectors and capers as someone who doesn't have name recognition, who doesn't have any previous games and to say to people, look what I've made. Isn't it great? Isn't it amazing? You can help make this happen and have people respond. Mm -hmm. That is fantastic. And, you know, there's there's some certain amount of satisfaction and, and just creating and going that you know that you did it. You know, you could play it with family and friends. Mm-hmm. But to receive that validation, you know, through a, su- a successful Kickstarter, that's really cool. <laughs> exactly. I thought it was a good idea. And these other people did, too. That's right. great. <laughs> I'm not crazy. Okay, maybe we're all crazy together, but at least I'm in good company then. Mm-hmm. There you go. Uh, talking about the game, how many how many iterations did you go through in that year and a half? And uh, and had, did the game substantially change from beginning to to release? I do have to say it does substantially change, and that nothing you come up with initially on paper should make it to market exactly as you initially plan it. So, how many major iterations were there? There was definitely three major iterations that occurred with the first one being really clunky and slow and also trying to steal the Mox gems, which, you know, Wizards of the Coast would not allow whatsoever. (laughs) The second one, which had improved some of the gameplay, but something was not quite there with, I mean, even basic stealing. It just wasn't quite there. And the major breakthrough came with that third iteration where it all started to make sense. All the base mechanics which you've experienced and the other reviewers and people who can read, who read the Kickstarter can read, it it all sort of fell into place from there. And there have been minor updates. So, I mean, you can argue that there's now a fourth iteration, which is the final one, but that'd be sort of a ring species effect of little changes all along the way. Mm -hmm. But three major ones. Okay, well, that's not too bad, I guess. <laughs> Lots of careful thought and listening to what people were saying went into mm. that. I mean, 
I may have had the initial idea, but it was the people who play tested my games who really helped bring them to life because they have great ideas. They have great ideas. They have great criticisms. And in listening to those, this became a lot more than I could have initially imagined. Very cool. And what was the what was the initial thought behind the game? Was there were you watching a movie or or you know what? How did it you know sort of come about for you? Well, initially I thought, okay, I want to create create games. I have this one game in the idea, but I also want to create this other game because I want to think of stealing and lying and things that people normally just can't do without being arrested and whatnot. <laughs> so I was thinking about that. And as I was thinking about that, I, I ended up playing a Sly Cooper, the, some of the games of the Sly Cooper series, play, being nostalgic for that. And I went, I need to make a heist theme game. Not I should, I need to make a heist theme game and bring that sort of magic that you see on TV, that you play in video games, to life onto the tabletop. And that was sort of the initial impetus. And initially I wanted to be like, the only rule was that there really was no rules and that you had these other <laughs> guidelines. That turns out to be difficult to balance. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How do you balance when someone could just say, mm, no, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this instead. Mm -hmm. So... That was around the first iteration. The second one really struggled with bluffing and how to make it so that there was enough of incentive to bluff, but enough of a penalty for being caught bluffing. Because, I mean, with BS, you get all the cards in the middle. Sometimes you have to bluff with that, and sometimes you can be really clever, but when you're playing, it's... It's not fun to be like, well, I know so-and-so has all the aces. So as soon as I say this, I'm going to get all 51 cards <laughs> that are left in the deck and mm -hmm. going to lose. So trying to really find that careful balance between making bluffing incentivized as well as not overly punitive when you're called out. Because... Why else would you bluff? I mean, you could just collect straight sets of everything, put it down, and be safe. And it's like, oh, sweet, I have a set collecting game that doesn't do anything else. Right. People like to bluff. I mean, that's why poker is fun. Mm hmm So that was, the main, that was the main thing. And that's what led to the third breakthrough was really figuring out that nice balance between risk-reward. Mm-hmm. Right, and, and you know we're kind of talking all around the game. Why don't you take right, us right. through like a, a typical round of play? All right. Well, a typical round of play, you have two heist points to spend, and these in other games and other systems are called action points. But if you play act, play action points to use action points to play actions, it starts to get really confusing. And I really want to make this clear and simple. So you have two heist points for both those heist points. You can steal from a player or the museum, the, the table, as it were. And you have to take a set of cards from your hand, of at least three cards, put them down in front of you, and claim that they are all matching a particular treasure. Then a round of bidding of whether or not you're telling the truth occurs. And if you get called out, everyone bids against you or the number of cards bid is equal to the set you, the number of cards in the set you put down. You have to reveal and discard anything that wasn't you being honest. But if you were honest, everyone discards their other cards. So stealing, big thing. Can't win without it. Mm -hmm. Then you can also draw cards from either a deck of cards, which no one knows what's there, or from a set of face-up informants which everyone can see and has access to on their turn which leads to an interesting how much do i want people to know about what's in my hand is mm -hmm. if i let them know i have three chalices chalice and i have four cards are they going to guess that i put down the three chalice or slip in something extra so really there's you can draw cards you can swap out your secrets which 
doesn't hinder players from being locked in from having a goal just in case someone else gets a monopoly because it, then you don't want a player to have a moment where they go, well, what's the point? I can't steal this. There's no way for me to actually be able to win. What am I going to do? I guess I'm going to king make now. No, 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 no. You don't want that. So you can spend a heist point to swap out a secret for another secret, or you can play an action. Now, John, these actions, there's just three of them, but they have a special ability depending on whether or not you play one or two of them at the same time. Mm-hmm. Adding to the extra flexibility that players have in the game. Like, do you want to collect more actions so you can use the more powerful ability? Or do you want to collect more of the regular heist cards so that you can steal things? It all becomes a becomes very strategic. And what I've found is that this is a game that is easy to learn because you just have those four things you can do but it becomes a lot more psychological and difficult to master as you play more of it. Yeah. You really have to know who you're playing with to know, you know, can I bluff? Should I bluff? Uh, you know, do, do I think they're bluffing? Maybe I want to look at their hands or I want to look at their face down cards. Uh, right. yeah, so you get into a lot of that, you know, sort of back and forth with the people you're playing with. Exactly. And even like, it, okay. So I think this person's lying but I want so-and-so to lose more cards from their hand. So I'm only going to put down one card as opposed to two to ensure that this is going to go down so that they also lose cards. So even being cooperative is a bit on the uh, antagonistic side. (laughs) Yeah, it can be. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. I like that kind of game. I play a lot of games with my brother and it's, it's pretty much just an F you back and forth every time that we play. (laughs) So I'm, I'm good for that kind of play style. (laughs) Exactly. And, and you really have to balance between making sure it's all in good fun and doesn't go outside the magic circle. And with Mm -hmm. collectors and capers, I like to think I found that balance because yeah, you lost cards because someone convinced you that, so-and-so was stealing this unfairly and they were stealing it fairly so well but you just lost cards from your hand you can pick up more it's all right you haven't necessarily lost the game yet yeah (laughs) yet no it's cool i mean it's it's a lot of fun it's it's you know it's a quick play it's pretty easy to pick up i'm bad rules wise so it usually takes me a couple of clunky you know, hands or rounds or games to sort of figure out what's going on. And, you know, and the, like I said earlier, the cool thing with Kickstarters, you know, I had a couple of questions and I shot them over to you and I'm like, I'm not sure about this. Can you explain? And you're like, Oh, yep. Here you go. It's X, Y, Z. Okay. Mm-hmm. I absolutely get it now. That's awesome. <laughs> exactly. And I've taken those questions that you and other people have had, and I put that into a FAQ section so that people can easily go over some of the finer points of the rules and some of the questions that they may have. Because that was one of the things that some of my buddies on the East Coast said. It's like, this looks great, but I have all these questions. Like, what can I do on my first turn? And what about this scenario and this scenario and this scenario? It's like, sounds like I should have some (laughs) questions to answer and make sure that people are all clear on that. Because I want this to be as simple as possible for people to pick up off the shelves, put on the table and play. Mm-hmm. Well, that, I mean, that, that kind of does become the issue, right? You know, you spend a year and a half with a game and you know it inside mm-hmm. and out, soup to nuts, you know, everything that could go. And, you know, sometimes that doesn't translate, you know, when you're doing rules, cause you're like, right. Oh, boo, boo, boo. You know, it's like trying to train somebody at work. You're like, all right, you do mm-hmm. this, this, and this. And they're like, well, wait a minute. You just did those two other things. What was that? And you're like, Oh yeah, yeah. You yeah. have to do that too. <laughs> exactly. Or when you use the the TLAs, the three-letter acronyms, Mm -hmm. and everyone goes, wait, 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 what are you saying? Oh, yeah. yeah. Exactly. I I have to, I didn't include it in the review, but I have to tell you, just for me, when I was looking at it, and I I get heist point, it's, you know, it fits with the theme, it it makes complete sense. I play so much D&D, I saw HP, and I'm like... (laughs) 
<sighs> it just reminds me of hit points. Every time I look at it, I want to call it something else. <laughs> You know, and, and that is absolutely fair. And that is something I also thought of, and I, and I just went, how much more difficult is it going to be for me to use action points and say action every time and not have it be within theme compared to someone saying, okay, HP, have it be different? Because this gets back to the demographic I was designing for. Not necessarily everyone at the table is going to have played D&D &D or Pokemon. Yeah. Or now that I think about it, any RPG it, that w that's on the market. Right. So it's it's a wee bit confusing. It's one of the little things that, that I really had to debate about as I was writing the rules. But I think the theme has to trump in this case. Yeah, no, and, and it certainly fits. I mean, that's, that's, that's why I didn't even bother, you know, to include it in a review. And every time that we, you know, discussed the game when we were playing, I just mm -hmm. automatically set a heist point instead of, you know, HP, just to, for my own. <laughs> well, that's good. Mind. That's good. <laughs> Uh, that's funny. Hey, I, I was looking, so we, you know, we have all the show notes and everything. I have to say, I love your Boba Fez. <laughs> oh yes that that was great that was one of the goers of etx had it and i and i just looked at that and went boba fez i i need to have a photo with that <laughs> sir may i have a picture with that fez that you have so put on took a photo and uh, wish i had one myself but alas mm -hmm. not all can be perfect yeah, yeah. We, uh, our uh, local comic convention here, they had an artist there who had, uh, you know, various works, but he had a really nice Boba Fett, and it was like, you know, the head and the reflection of like, you know, Han mm -hmm. and the thing. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to come back for it because I don't want to carry it all day. Mm -hmm. Sold out. So I'm at another con a couple of months later. Oh, I didn't bring any. I'm like, God damn it. No. <laughs> Exactly. Oh, man. Eh, what are you going to do, right? <laughs> Find them the third time. Well, there you go. Well, two, the Tucson Comic Con is coming up again in uh, in November, so maybe I'll catch them then. I'll just get it. <laughs> <laughs> Carry it around all day. Taking the acolytes as you can. Yeah, well, you know, run out to the car and go throw them in there and come back. <laughs> uh, so... I, you know, you do you so as your work as a as a you know and software and computers and whatnot. Do you mm -hmm. do any game design for work, or is it more specifically like you know coding for you know like business transactions or something like that? This is all back end so software development engineer of test work. So I do automated testing and making sure that. The environments are stable, act as the gatekeeper for people as they bring in new code and new feature changes, make sure it's all been thoroughly vetted before it goes out the door. So that's what I do. I, I really try to make sure that my day work and my night work don't intermingle because that gets into some murky waters I really don't want to have to deal with. Sure, eventually, sure. eventually, I do want to do Android and iOS games. But that would have to be completely on my own time, clear it with my bosses and everything. My C the CEO of the company I work for backed my Kickstarter, so I think I'm in the clear right now. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so hopefully that's a good sign and not a subtle suggestion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's cool. All right. Well, you know, that's it's good. You know, work is dry, so then you come, you know, come home and be able to uh, you know, sort of scratch that creative itch. So that that's a that's a good deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. exactly exactly compartmentalize the work and the play as it were mm -hmm. now have you always been a gamer yourself you sort of like you know part cheesy oh, yeah. and stuff with the family or you know your D&D &D player what's your background as far as gaming goes well when I was playing with my family we did Rat Attack Cat, Ticket to Ride card, the card version of Settlers of Catan that was big also uh Egyptian rat screw, you know, slam witch, basically. And always playing games, always sort of in on that 
video games, having a PS1, playing all those. I mean, whole sort of gambit there. Getting into magic when I was six, seven. Oof. Wow, that's been a while. <laughs> they've, they've had me for a while now. <laughs> so, gamer my whole life, done D&D, absolutely love every game, love learning new games, new systems. Absolutely fantastic. Just background is all over the place i wouldn't have it any other way that that's awesome and and you know playing you know some some non-traditional style board games with your folks and stuff that that's really cool like you know we played yeah. Porchisi and monopoly and like you know all the the basic stuff you know so we never really you know got got into that and you know i'll take games to my parents house and they're like what is this i don't understand it <laughs> We're just going to break out Monopoly again. So, yeah. We play a lot of Pinochle. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'm old. <laughs> but uh, no, so that, that's cool that they, yeah. that they kind of jumped you right off from the, from the get go and be like, you know, Hey, let's, let's play these weird, you know, Euro style games and you know, all this oh, other stuff. Oh, definitely. And I also have to thank the uh, family group that I'm in or my parents were in a first parents or a support group. And we've, we are still in contact and know each other. And there's a few people there who play five crowns and Quiddler bang, all of those games. So we took some of those and integrated into them into our board game night. So all around straight time, lots of fun. Cool. Now, do you still do like a, uh, you know, like a board game night with the, uh, with your parents or, you know, oh, yeah. wife, girlfriend sort of thing? Well, the girlfriend, She's more into video games, so we do some of that together. But with my family, definitely we sit down for a ticket to ride or a Quiddler or Five Crowns or even some of the games that I've been working on. They nice. played some earlier versions of Collectors and Capers. They have yet to play the newest one, and we're trying to get that sorted out. <laughs> yeah, you got to get them in there on that. Come on, that's a no-brainer. Exactly, exactly. I know, I know. <laughs> But well, you mentioned Ticket to Ride. I, I first time I ever played Ticket to Ride was Saturday. Never never played it before. Really? I, yeah. I, I'd recommend the Europe version. It's a lot more balanced in my opinion. Yeah, it, it was fun. That, uh, Portland to Seattle or Vancouver to Seattle bottleneck right there. That just means, well, damn, I've lost the game now. <laughs> yeah. Well, at the end, I was scraping to build the longest, uh, the longest rail. <laughs> mm -hmm. I got trounced, thoroughly trounced by the other two players. <laughs> uh, you'll get it in later games, I'm sure. There you go. Um, do you do you have a, a favorite style? Do you prefer, uh, you know, like a Euro style game or you know, like a dice chucker? Mm -hmm. Like, is there anything that really kind of scratches that itch for gaming for you? I think it has to depend on the mood. I do like Euro games. I think some of them, they focus too much on like keeping people all together or don't really have a good snowball effect towards the end or a catch-up effect for people behind. That makes things frustrating. Love Settlers of Catan, but doesn't quite scratch that itch for me. I mean, I've always loved, loved doing acting. Wish I could do more of it. For the people who have looked at the Kickstarter page, you can see my see me trying to put on a persona and all that jazz. So D and D scratches that itch for me. Hearthstone, Magic, that more competitive, just want to stomp all over someone or have a good victory. But when I'm with people, something more on the cooperative side. Forbidden mm -hmm. Islands, for instance, absolutely love that. Or and I know this may be getting into eclectic territory, the Ani Rim series. When it's just me playing a solitary game, can't recommend any games higher than the Ani Rim series. Ani mm -hmm. Rim, Sylveon, Castilion. Those three games, fantastic. Really spurred on my continuing love of game design and examining them. And yeah, I mean... I think that, among other things, really gets that itch, especially when it's like, don't quite have enough money to go out or absolutely tired and want to do something to recollect my thoughts. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's a social activity, which is cool. You know, you get a couple exactly. people come over, have a few beers, and, you know, sometimes the game is, you know, less important than just, mm -hmm. you know, kind of decompressing. And, and the I'm on another podcast, The Dragon Fisters, Ooh. and um, they really only get together to play D&D. &D. Like, huh. they don't generally, like, hang out during the week. So if they play once a week or every other week, like, that's the time that they socialize in. Right. You know, get to play Pathfinder, which is cool. But, mm -hmm. uh, like, that's their their medium. And, they, you know, Jesse has said, like, you know, if we didn't play D&D, &D, we may never hang out because <laughs> everybody's right. busy and, you know, mm -hmm. it, it just becomes a, a, a focus of, of social activity, which is a really cool thing. Oh, exactly. I had an experience like that in college. Great chaps. Give a shout out to them for being amazing and really getting me into role playing games. And having that once a week, maybe twice a week if we were lucky, sitting down, all seven of us, and going, all right. So, Ben, do you have anything planned today? No, we'll see what wild adventures you go on. Sweet. <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's flying by the seat of their pants. <laughs> oh, definitely. Some of the best stories came out of that. <laughs> yep. And you, and you tell them for years. I mean, it's, you know, board games are fun. I'm, I'm getting into that. I enjoy it. But, you know, you, you know, you spin a good yarn like that, you know, and it's cooperative and, you know, the GM is taking, you know, you throw things out and you're like, oh, I think it's this. And he's like, yeah, right, right. He's writing it down in the thing. So next session, that's what happens. And right, you know, right. just remember those things for years. Exactly. And getting back to board games, like one of the things I really worked on with collectors and capers was if you suspend your disbelief just for a little bit and really immerse yourself in the magic circle of that game, I can definitely see and visualize being on the museum floor, trying to get there, and finding the ancient statue's gone. Who took it? Yeah. What bastard took it from me? <laughs> Damn him. Or her. I mean, it's really sort of like thinking of the long calculating planning, culminating in oh, someone stealing something. And like you can build, really build a narrative with all that. And that is absolutely fantastic. That's how I like to play board games. At least that's what I do when, when I'm playing, I like to sort of take that imaginative side and say, so what's going on? What, what does each turn represent? Mm -hmm. That sort of D&D &D fashion, except we're all playing a game together. Is right. it antagonistic? Sure. Is it 1v many? Sure. Is it we don't know who's who or doing what? Sure doesn't matter it always goes back to that and i really wanted to focus on that with collectors and capers mm -hmm. absolutely so i i'm thinking that you're gonna uh, respond in the affirmative that theme is definitely a uh, uh uh an important part of of game design and game play then it is an important theme though i do thing though i do have to say you can put i could put a arabian nights like uh, Alibaba and the 40 Thieves skin on collectors and capers and keep the mechanics the same and the game would be just as good. You just need to have the theme work in a perfect marriage with the meta with the metaphor of the mechanics. Because it wouldn't make sense for this to be a a trading game for instance or right. for it to be set in um space. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it just wouldn't make sense. I mean, it really has... The theme does matter, and it does have to work with the rules. And that's the that's the important part. I mean, I've seen too many games where it's like, that's great, but I, the there's something that's just not working. There's a cognitive dissonance I have. And I worked really hard so that people would feel like they're in the movie. Well, I'd say play, excuse me. So. Theme is important, but without good mechanics, without good rules, without fun gameplay, the theme is just a painting. I mean. Right. Now, do you try to come up with mechanics 
first and then fit a theme to it? Is it kind of they come together as you're working on it together? You know, a theme will kind of develop itself out of mechanics. How does, how does that work for you? Well, what I like to do is sort of devoid myself of mechanics and theme initially and just have an idea, a crystallization of thought, the intent of what I'm trying to achieve. And this, it was making sure collectors and capers would be a bluffing game or a game where people could comfortably lie, which you can't really do in your day-to-day -day life, really explore that possibility. And so I take this little idea and I expand upon it and sort of say, okay, what mechanics fit into that? What theme fits with, within that? And grow it from there, sort of day by day, having it become what it is now, sort of pruning the un unnecessary branches, as it were. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have another game that I'm currently working on where I had a definite theme, I had a definite idea of what I wanted it to do, and that was a different approach and not one that I would normally take. Normally, I want to say, here's what I'm looking at. How can I grow and expand that to be something beautiful and fun to play? It, it, it's like the bonsai of game design. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to treat it that way. I mean, not every great idea makes it into a game, and I have several great ideas that I want to include into Collectors and Capers, and if we hit that stretch goal, then I will make sure that I dedicate the time and resources necessary to make sure that there's an advanced mode of play for Collectors and Capers that incorporates a lot of those ideas that have been swirling in, I've had to say, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is the crystallization of what I want initially. All this other stuff can be icing on the cake, but you have to have a good cake first. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, if, if by some strange reason you don't hit those stretch goals, is that something that you could potentially do, like, as an expansion later on? Oh, definitely. I already have an expansion in addition to these ideas in the back of my mind that I'm also trying to say, nope, 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 nope. Need to, <laughs> need to focus on one thing first. Get right. this done. Can't have the expansion without the base game. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And, and the game is only 15 bucks. So, I mean, it is only, it's only 15 bucks on Kickstarter. On when Kickstarter. it hits, the, when it hits the shelves, it will be 20, which small game, very simple. Don't want to go too too hog wild with the pricing, of course. There's some games where it's like, this is just a thing of cards. How's how is this thirty dollars? Oh, mm. there's all the bits and shits and pieces. No, 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 no. Simple as possible, twenty dollars, approachable price. But for people who play can back, you get the discounted rate of fifteen as mm -hmm. a thank you for believing in the idea before it hit the shelves. And for those are he oh wow I have to edit this part out. <laughs> for those of you who are listening now, you missed out on the twelve dollar pledge level. It's sold out, so you're stuck with fifteen, but you're still getting a great deal of fifteen dollars, five dollars off the off the, the the retail price, and you're getting a great game. Plays really quick. It's fun, easy to pick up. You throw it in a backpack. You throw it in your cargo pants pocket. You take it with you anywhere. And it's just a lot of fun to play. Exactly. And speaking as someone who has thrown collectors and capers into his backpack and his cargo pants po pocket, I have to attest it is still very lightweight and doesn't take up a lot of space. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> From the man who created the game. <laughs> Larry, why don't you throw the, uh, the website, give us all your contact details. Let's get all that stuff out there. All right. So my website is blueherongames.com. That's H-E-R-O-N, not H-A-R-R-O-N, which is my last name. Yes, it is a pun on play on words right there, as some of you may recognize. So you can find me on Facebook at Blue Heron Entertainment and Collectors and Capers, pages for both of those, as well as on Twitter with the handle Blue Heron Games. Awesome. So that way everybody can get you. And of course we have the, uh, the link to all that stuff in the, in the show notes. We've got a link to the Kickstarter page. Um, 
I, that's all the questions I have prepared. Um, we do have a thing we like to do at the end called the final five. We have five nerdy questions to throw at you. It's kind of a kind of a binary thing. It's sort of a yes or no, although you could go both. It's fine, but we try to all right, all right. challenge people to, to pick one or the other. All right, uh, let's bring it on. All right, so the first one is Star Trek or Star Wars? Star Wars, definitely. I mean, I grew, I grew up with Star Trek in the household, but it was Star Trek The Next Generation. Mm -hmm. It never really caught on caught on for me. And I still remember seeing Star Wars in the theaters, like the final one. It was around the block, and I was four or something. And like I still one of the stronger memories of going, so many people are going to watch <laughs> this. Wow. Nostalgia is strong, strong with Star Wars. Love the new movie. Not so much the first three, but, you know, that's a whole other discussion. Yeah, I'm, I, we're in the same boat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but my, my story is similar in the fact that I saw the original Star Wars when I was like five at the drive-in theater. Mm -hmm. And it was the same th sort of thing. And it's just, you know, it strikes such a chord, mm -hmm. especially at that age. Definitely. Uh, to, to really resonate. My, you know, my dad watched Star Trek and, and all that kind of stuff, but you know, it's new shiny sci-fi world or old and dirty lived in, you know, I mean, it's a completely different aesthetic for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I, Definitely. I, you know, I, I, I prefer Star Wars myself. I've actually been binge watching Rebels for the last two days. <laughs> uh, I need to do that. I have not had a chance to. The Kickstarter Awful. is taking up too much time. Now, for people who haven't heard, and I can't imagine there's many at this point, Grand Admiral Thrawn is being reintroduced into canon. He's going to be part of uh, the third uh, season of, uh, of Rebels. So I'm like, shit, I got to rewatch all these now. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's going to follow, you know, any of the, uh, you know, the original books that he was in, but I mean, I guess it can't. I mean, it's a I different. Can, I can hope so. I mean, that was one of the, for me, that like as a fan, when Disney bought Star Wars and made it non-canon, I went, "No, no." But what about what about Maria? What about what about Luke's son? What about all of that? Come on, you have yep. so much material to work with. Yeah, they could have made movies for years. I mean, how many books are out now? Jesus, there's got to be like right. forty or fifty of them. That's that's great. I mean, okay, maybe Luke. Maybe Luke Skywalker would be on the older side, but you could reference some of the older stuff. Come on, you can do it. I know you can do it, Disney. Make the magic happen. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, tabletop or video games? Uh, well, that's a tougher one. And I know I shouldn't be doing option, option three, but I have to go with option three because there is a time and a place for both. If I just want to do some, do something like God of War, okay. There's a time for that. It's a mindset. It's play that, be done. If I'm going to go out to my game store and play there, no, not my personal game store, not <laughs> my wish, but go to the game, my local game store, I'm going to do tabletop. I don't care that there are arcade machines up there. I came there to meet people, to have beer, and to play games and possibly lose at them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I, well, you can't I always think, get everybody together. So sometimes video games, like that's the option. Exactly. And what I want to do eventually, like, and this is years and years down the road, John, where I want to take tabletop and video games and bring them together so that they're each their own separate experience and then together another experience entirely and that's something i have working in the back of my mind i don't have a definite project for that but i can guarantee in the next 10 years i'm definitely going to bring that to the proverbial virtual reality real table nice well that's not so much proverbial anymore you got oculus rift and all these oculus different things rift, ar absolutely love AR and the possibilities it brings as a game designer. It's exciting. <laughs> All right, that's cool. That's cool. We'll, have to, we'll keep an eye out for that. Um, mm -hmm. DC or Marvel? 
right. Well, excuse me. <laughs> I have to. I have to go with Marvel on this one. I mean, I love some of the characters in DC. Batman's always great. Arrow and Flash are always fun. But there's. I can't do Superman. I, I just can't. And people have given me the arguments of like, well, the fact that he has so much power and does good makes him good. It's like, yeah, great. You have a Mary Sue who can literally come back from the dead, turn back time, do anything. There's no plot tension. There is no reason for me to, to have any stake in what's going on. I like when the characters have flaws. I mean, people like people like that, and the characters in Marvel. They definitely have their flaws. That none of them are approaching godlike status on themselves, at least so far in the movies, and not exactly in the comics. Though there are some arguments I know that can be made, and I also can't deal with the superman punches the universe hard enough to create the incontinuities that we found in the dc universe yeah well and and like you said the flaws makes the characters more relatable you know especially exactly. the teens and they're angsty you know whatever and right you know, married and you know work sucks and you know you can you know read a book and like oh spider-man's boss is a dick like you know you just it, it creates. Hey, I, uh, I get that. I, I can understand that. I can relate to that. Exactly. Yeah. It, it you know creates a touchstone for the readers. Exactly. I mean, I do have to say the watching the show The Arrow definitely one of my favorite experiences because the character is so flawed and at times such a pardon the term asshole. It's just like okay, no, I get where he's coming from. I get that he's wrong in the moral sense. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm fine with that because that's a character, that's a person, that's not. Hi, I'm an alien that's willing to help you out and do everything that you possibly can imagine and better. And by the way, you might as well treat me like a god because I can turn back time. Apparently, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, sci-fi or fantasy? Ooh. See, I love when the guests are just like, fuck, really? <laughs> what kind of fantasy? Uh, high fantasy, oh. Tolkien-esque, you know. I, see, Tolkien-esque is good, but it's also really tried. Don't get me wrong. Love elves, orcs, and all that. But low fantasy? That, that has a special place in my heart. The um, Wheel of Time series, for instance, one of my favorites. The uh, Dragon Gate cycle as well. I mean, the Rift War saga. All, well, the Rift War saga was taking high fantasy and low fantasy and saying, okay, now together. <laughs> Which is great. Sci-fi, I think actual sci-fi is good. Now, I have to explain that because you have sci-fi fantasy, which is Star Wars, Star Trek, well, Star Wars, which is fun, but there's also ooh, space magic sort of things yeah. that happen. Yeah. But Firefly, Star Trek, which I know I didn't choose, but <laughs> though, both of those are sci-fi and are fantastic because they're just like, this is everyday life. Why, why are you tripping? It's, all, it's okay. We, we have teleporters. We, we expect people to have teleporters and to know what they're doing. I mean, this, this isn't magic, folks. This is science. We understand what's going on here. Mm -hmm. This isn't some nebulous thing that may interact with the biology of your body or not. So, uh, that was a long ramble, ramble with no... <laughs> That's okay. Having said all of that, I probably would have to go with fantasy in that I love sci-fi. Great sci-fi books sort of built my reading library. But also fantasy takes you in a direction that you don't necessarily expect, really expands upon a world that is not familiar to your own. And I think there is a lot of merit in that that you don't necessarily get out of sci-fi. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, especially if you're going like Blade Runner, like how far are we mm-hmm. from that at this point? Where you exactly. know if you're, uh, you know, Helms Deep or whatever, you're like, yeah, well, that's crazy, you know, fucking the elves and ants <laughs> and you know. There's, exactly. there's there's more escapism involved. I, I feel like for fantasy than you know for sci-fi because we, you know, we're hitting all those things that you know like in the '50s sci-fi, like pfft, we're past that 20 years ago. Like you exactly. know, that's nothing now. Um, you know, like the ori- original Rogue Trader uh, RPG or, or even Shadowrun. You look at that stuff now, and you're like, oh my god, that's so dated. Like you know, you pull out your cell phone, it's like. Boring. Bring out what's next, Empire. Oh, what's that? Technology is heresy. Maybe you should pray to the machines more. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, All right, and the last one is, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Ooh, this is always a tough one because it has to be one. And it has to be... And it... There's so many caveats that go with it. Like, I could do flying, but it's like, well, but my lungs aren't really developed for it. I could do br- go breathing underwater, but it's like, okay, so I now can suffer from hypothermia. Great. <laughs> here's here's what, I, what, what I would like. The ability to have a checkpoint save point system. Oh. So I could say, okay, set a marker right here. Let's go. Let's see what happens. Respawn back to here if anything goes wrong. Like, if I if I cross the street and I say set a point here, I cross the street, I look both ways, and all of a sudden a motorcycle that was go- illegally running a red light hits me. Respawn back and go. Okay, motorcycle go. So something along the that those lines. I, I like that. That that might actually actually get me to skydive if I could set a reset point. <laughs> okay, this worked out. This worked <laughs> out. I had to set a reset point before the parachute deployed, but everything worked out from there. Yeah. I, I have two friends that went to go did it, and they were like, you got to go. And I'm like, I would love oh. to. I'm scared of heights, but I, that feeling has just got to be amazing. Well, I'm like, there's no fucking way. <laughs> Got got to clean everything out before you do that. Just in yeah. case. <laughs> I couldn't. Absolutely. I couldn't do that. Hmm. No, I, I I would love to, but I I don't see that happening anytime soon. <laughs> right. Uh, well, I I want to thank you for coming on. I I know we probably talked less about collectors and capers than just about you know stuff in general, but. Uh, everybody should go check that out. There's there's links in the show notes. Like I said earlier, 15 bucks gets you the game. It's fantastic. You have a lot of fun playing. Um, you check out the Blue Heron games. I, I'll let you do all this part. <laughs> yeah, please ch- please check me out on Facebook, Blue Heron Entertainment. Follow me on Twitter at Blue Heron Games. Like the Collectors and Capers Facebook page, and please 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 check it out. I can guarantee you'll at least like the artwork. And if you do, it's going to be a treasure on your shelf and you can have fun playing it. John had a good time. I have a good time. And I've been playing it for the past year and a half. So <laughs> it hasn't gotten old yet. <laughs> it hasn't gotten old yet. And I don't think it's going to. That's awesome. Well, uh, thanks for coming on. I'm going to give out all of our stuff here at the end as I do. Uh, you can check us out on the, on the, on the web at legendsoftabletop.com. Uh, you can send your questions, comments, and feedback to legendsoftabletop at gmail.com. On Twitter, we are at Legends Tabletop. Uh, we're on iTunes. We're on uh, Google Play, Music Thing, uh, SoundCloud, Stitcher, you know, Put us into your aggregator. You'll find us there somewhere. Uh, check us out on Instagram. All the stuff is on the, on the website. So I want to thank everybody for checking this out, and we will catch you next time. If I can, the cat stepped on the thing. I'm going to try to.